Test, test, test. Oh yeah, looks like I'm good. Okay. I'm Phil Wyman and this is the Wild Theology Podcast where the world, the humans in it, and God are all wilder than we've been told. That's your intro. So, you'll get philosophy and theology and crazy stories that come from 30 years of pastoring. Boring. 20 years of festival work. Whatever. And the uh, mud and blood of wrestling with the living in the spaces angels fear to tread. Ooh, trying to sound interesting, are we? <laughs> no. Yeah, you think you got something to say? Yes. Yeah, that's the problem, Dimwit. Look, I'm a lot smarter than you think. Yeah, you tied your shoes this morning. Whatever. We are Phil Wyman, and this is Wild Theology, where you get to argue with your own ideas. And lose. That's the point. If you would like to support this podcast, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash philwyman. This podcast is Wild Theology's podcast topic, Love Big or Go Home, Part 2. And we're talking about the mission of the church and its nomadic uh, component. Go is the operative word for the gospel. Go into all the nations and preach the gospel. That's what we're told. This was the post-resurrection command of Jesus to his disciples. It was, well, it would be reiterated just before he left them to return home to heaven. He said, You shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. Jesus had spent a good deal of his time as a nomad on this earth. Now he was instructing his first generations of apostles to do the same. After the initial Day of Pentecost revival experience happened among travelers who came to Jerusalem to experience the Jewish Holy Day, as the book of Acts continues, we find that the most dynamic stories of evangelistic engagement were happening on the road. Peter would have a vision from his rooftop and be compelled to go preach the gospel in the household of a Roman soldier. Philip would suddenly find himself in another location. He remotely traveled to another place without a bus ticket or a ride share. He baptized the Ethiopian eunuch, and when the eunuch rose from the water, Philip was gone. He was already preaching in another place far away. Persecution reaches the early church in Jerusalem and across Judea, and the people end up fleeing their homes. But they don't leave their excitement about the gospel of Jesus behind. They take it with them. And we are told that the number of believers grew. Saul of Tarsus, later known as the Apostle Paul, was a leading figure in this persecution. He had an encounter with Christ on the way to causing more trouble among the believers of this new religious sect and was converted. Following his conversion, he became as zealous for his new cause as he was for the old cause. The book of Acts quickly follows the ministry of the Apostle Paul, who takes moving around to a new level. Paul travels to share the gospel. Sometimes he has enough time to develop leadership in the city and leave the church in good hands. Other times he is forced to move on by angry town leaders. Eventually, he finds himself under house arrest far from home in Rome, and even here the gospel spreads among the servants of Caesar. It's also clear that Paul is not alone as a traveling preacher of the gospel. Barnabas separates from Paul and travels with the young Mark, who Paul refused to travel with after the young men abandoned them during their first missionary journey. There are brief mentions of Priscilla and Aquila and their work, and Paul comes across a group of traveling ministers who have been sharing only what they knew of the John the Baptist's baptism. Transient ministry appears alive and well in the book of Acts. This nomadism is driven by people who hear the call to travel and visions and dreams. Some nomadism is driven by the social and economic factors of the time or by the simple zeal of individuals who are passionate about their newfound faith. The wild growth of Christianity in the first century owes a debt to transients. Christianity appears to have thrived in seasons of the greatest instability. In the first couple centuries, after the death of these first apostles of Christ, the nomadic lifestyle would become a model for many people in the church. But this nomadism 
would take on uncommonly radical elements. The movement of Christians leaving home and seeking God in the wilderness began before Antony, but Saint Antony the Great is now considered by many people to be the father of all monks. Thanks to early church fathers such as Athanasius and Augustine, his name would become synonymous with the desert fathers and mothers. These wild saints would leave their homes, travel into the desert, and seek God in the wilderness. Some, called Anchorites, left home and lived in isolation. Others, called Cenobites, moved into communities together. Others still were given a host of names, not always complimentary, such as Jerovics. They traveled as a part of an evangelistic mission in search of wisdom or in the belief that they should emulate Christ who had, quote, nowhere to lay his head, unquote. This nomadism, of course, could not have seemed out of place to Christians living just a couple generations away from the birth and death of the nomadic Christ and the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. They fed their faith on the stories of Christ's temptations in the wilderness and the 40 years of wandering by the Israelites on the way to the Promised Land. Saint Anthony the Great was born in Egypt on January 12, 251 and died on January 17th. 356. Well, those are the dates we are given in this hagiographies at least. It would appear that we have Athanasius of Alexandria to thank for the Vita Antony, which describes his life and work. The spread of this biography popularized the radical monastic lifestyle for centuries to come. According to Athanasius, Antony's parents were fairly wealthy landowners. They died when he was around 18 years old, and within a couple of years, he sold everything, because as he understood it, the gospel told him to. It said, if you want to be perfect, go, sell what you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. This comes from Matthew 19.21. He reserved some of his money for his sister's support, and left her in the hands of what was the equivalent of a proto-convent of Christian virgins, and went to live the ascetic life. Antony fasted often and at one point moved into a tomb, shut himself inside it, and relied upon a friend to bring him, quote, bread at intervals of many days, unquote. This is from his Vita, page 15. Antony's story is one of radical asceticism and solitary living, but there are stories of deep wisdom and miracles occurring when he interacted with society. He spent 20 years holed up in an abandoned Roman fort and later wandered even further out into the desert. Although he was not the first of the hermit monks, he was likely the first to wander so far into the desert in search of the truly solitary life. But his fame as a holy man would not allow for complete isolation. People would follow him into the wilderness of Nitria, seeking his wisdom and asking for his prayers in search of a miracle for their ailments and calamities. Ancient and medieval sacred art reimagines the struggles of Anthony and his waging war against demons that tormented him day and night. At the beginning of his aromatic lifestyle, his friend pulled him from the tomb he had shut himself in because he was on the edge of starvation and death, supposedly having been beaten by the tormenting demons. After being nursed back to health, the story tells us on the same night that he was recovering, he woke and returned to his tomb. The stories of battling demons would follow him throughout his long life, and Anthony would die at the ripe age of 105. His Vita, written by his contemporary Athanasius, the 20th Bishop of Alexandria, would be read throughout Christendom for centuries and would become a major influence on such important leaders as Augustine of Hippo, who was born around the time of Antony's death. This is why Saint Antony the Great has become known as the father of all monks. But Antony was not the only luminary in the monastic traditions of the ancient and still young Christian church, nor was his style of monasticism the only tradition developing during this time. The Acts of Thomas is a third century writing, which is highly unlikely to have been written by the Apostle himself, 
but it is an early writing of the church that depicts the wildest elements of Christian mission in the first through third centuries. In these crazy tales, Thomas travels to India to preach the gospel. To this day, there are Nasarani or St. Thomas Christian communities that date their inception to the proclamation of the faith by Thomas in India. The story in the Acts of Thomas tells of his refusal to obey the voice of God asking him to travel to preach the gospel. So God sold him into slavery and forced him east to India. Thomas, like later Jairovags, models his life after a nomadic and homeless vagrant who had nowhere to lay his head. The third century leader Mani would enlist scores of people to travel, sing the songs of the Lord in public places, debate religion in the public square, and live an ascetic lifestyle. Part of the Manichaean asceticism was to fast off and live homeless and only eat what was given to them by others. The Manichaeans would be identified by both the Christian Church and the Roman Empire as heretics and would eventually be stamped out by political and martial force, but not before their influence spread like wildfire. Augustine of Hippo identified as a Manichaean before his own conversion to a more orthodox faith. Manny's beliefs extended well beyond orthodox Christian teachings. He appears to have believed that the teachings of Buddha, Zoroaster, and Jesus were incomplete and that the teachings of his religion of light filled in the gaps that were missing. The growth of Manichaeanism would be spectacular and would not be abated until the 7th century. Although Manny's followers represent a strange and unorthodox sect of Christianity, their homeless transients mirrors the life of Christ and the apostolic journeys and the Manichaean's incredible success remains an example of the power of nomadic mission. Meanwhile, in the West, Fructuosus wandered around Iberia barefoot and wearing goatskins. At the end of the fourth century, Egeria from Galicia, which is modern-day northern Portugal, traveled to the Holy Land and documented her travels for her sisters and the faith back home. The Itinerarium Egeria is filled with vivid accounts of holy places she visits and holy people she meets. She returns with some items for her fellow nuns, but this does not appear to be the reason for her travels. Maribel Dietz describes Egeria's greatest excitement, coming from the holy brethren she meets along the way. Egeria's travels are seen as an example of Christian pilgrimage, but in some ways she appears to be more like an extension of the ascetic wonders like the Desert Fathers and Mothers than someone looking for absolution or healing. And Dietz sees Egeria as an example of the numerous other spiritual women travelers of her time. About the time, same time as Egeria, Bacchiarius, who appears to have been a monk from Spain, writes a letter defending his orthodoxy, and it seems his transient lifestyle is one of the reasons for needing to defend himself. This need for monks to defend their orthodoxy would become important from the 4th century onward. The influence of Jerome and Augustine of Hippo would demand that people hold firmly to sound doctrine. It could be that Bacchiarius is one of the few gyrovags or wandering monks whose writings remain on record today. Melania the Younger died in 439. She followed in the footsteps of her mother, Melania the Elder, who was a traveling monastic. Melania the Younger was married to a wealthy cousin, Pinianus, when she was 13. When their two children died, she persuaded her husband that they should live together as monastics, and in doing so, they lived together as brother and sister. Melania the Younger would travel from monastic community to monastic community and give generous gifts to the monasteries and monks. Maribel Dietz's study of women monastic travelers highlights not only the fact that women were a large part of the traveler community, but that their place in it was a means of liberation from the oppression of the Roman Empire. Women were discovering freedom from arranged marriages. Their vows of chastity gave them some degree of empowerment against an over-sexualized culture. They even found themselves with a degree of fame and spiritual authority uncommon in the political 
or business world. These nomadic lifestyles of Christian ministry emulating the homelessness of Christ would make it as far away as Ireland, and as early as the 5th and 6th century, with the work of Patrick, Columba, Columbanus, and many others, the gospel would be spread by nomads. Patrick would hear the voice of God calling him to return to the place he had escaped after having spent years in servitude as a slave. Patrick would leave his Britain home in what was probably North Wales today and return to a place of his slavery to become one of the patron saints of Ireland. A generation later, the monk Columba would be exiled from his Irish home for inciting violence among the brethren and would establish his monastic community on the Scottish Isle of Iona. From there, Columba would evangelize the Picts. Today, he is remembered as one of the three patron saints of Ireland, and along with others less well known, such as Saint Ethernam, also as an evangelist to the Picts. Brendan the Navigator would take traveling ministry to a whole other level. Brendan's voyages would not only touch the islands around Scotland, but supposedly he would reach America as early as the 7th century. The amazing growth of early Christianity owes great debt to what looks like an unstable group of wanderers. In fact, it may be that the radical initial growth is stymied by its own developing stability. As the church defends its doctrines, which is an appropriate thing to do, it also begins to suppress the movement of wandering monks and pilgrims. In behaving like the empire around it, which distrusts and frames laws to hinder nomadism and vagrancy, leaders like Augustine suppress the free movement of the gospel and its radically adaptive potential. We'll look further into the developing illegality of nomadism in the early church in the next podcast. If you've enjoyed this podcast and you'd like to help support it, you can do so at patreon.com slash philwyman. Thanks for checking in. Thank you to David Gerard for his ambient music. What you heard today was 1248 AM Black Rock, and you can find more of his music at bandcamp.ambientism.com. If you'd like to support this project, you can do so here on Patreon for as little as $1 a release, and at the most, that's $4 a month. Why on earth would anybody want to support us? Well, I think we're pretty cool, and maybe some people believe in what we're doing. Oh, come on, you believe that? Hmm, yeah. Don't you ever think you're just a little too weird for the average person? Um, yeah, sometimes.